Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkash. The D8 Organization for Economic Cooperation celebrated its 25th anniversary in its birthplace, Istanbul, on Thursday. The organization, which consists of eight Muslim developing nations, aims to improve the member states' position in the global economy. The summit was held at a time of crisis as the world faces a food shortage caused by the conflict in Ukraine, as well as an ongoing pandemic and rising anti-Muslim sentiment. Let's take a look at this report. Over the past 25 years, uh, the organization has been able to initiate and implement mechanisms for greater cooperation between the D8 countries. And to discuss it further, I'm joined by Osama Rizvi from Lahore, Pakistan. He's an analyst covering energy, economics and geopolitics. And on set by Taha Meli Arvas, who is an adjunct professor of finance at Boazici University here in Istanbul. A warm welcome to you both, Taha. Let me begin with you. How has the D8 Organization for Economic Cooperation evolved since its inception 25 years ago? I think on paper, uh, the idea of these diverse countries uh, coming together was, is a great one because um, while they're, they're similar in, in, their, um, uh, in their makeups of their uh, countries, of their populations rather, somewhat, they are as diverse as they are similar. Um, and I, it's good that they, they I mean, it, it, the concrete steps that should have been taken or can still be taken are, are much ahead of this uh, group of countries because there is a lot that can be done as far as cooperation goes. They, they've signed a lot of bilateral trade yes. agreements, et cetera, but it's time to really, because it's the first time since the inception that the world is in the midst of this great uh, economic turmoil. So it looks like they have a lot of work ahead of themselves. So uh, Osama, what's your take on that? I mean, how, what kind of a role Turkey has been uh, playing since the foundation of this organization? And how viable is the idea of bringing together all these eight uh, developing Muslim nations to enhance cooperation? Uh, amid the ongoing crisis as well as the uh, pandemic? Yeah, so I would agree with Taha. I mean, from a journal and generic point of view, uh, I believe the need for such alliances, uh, the need for such blocks, especially in terms of economic cooperation, it's, uh, it's the greatest, uh, you know, uh, given the consequences uh, we have been suffering from rather uh, a resurgence of protectionist policies across the world. So, mm -hmm. but once again, all of this sounds good on paper, However, in terms of uh, what is happening in reality, I think, once again, there is a lot of room that can be used, a lot of improvement that can be done. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, just a very small statistic. So I was reading that back in a uh, few years back, they thought that by 2018 and 2019, their intra-trade would, uh, would amount to somewhat around 15% of their total trade. But even right now, it is way way less than that, around some 6.5%. So this, just to highlight that, how much of an improvement, how much of a room uh, the organization still has in, mm. its, uh, in its growth. So Tan, what are the prospects for future cooperation, especially on defense, energy, and food security? Well, uh, to, to just to highlight a point that Osama was talking about in, in answering your question, uh, we were, up until the pandemic, globally in a, in a very... Uh, in a globalization mode where mm -hmm. all the barriers for trade were decreased and people were very, uh, countries were uh, e able to trade with each other. Then the pandemic happened yes. and all these protectionist barriers came up. And so countries are now 
even with Brexit and with other developing uh, stories, we see the countries are looking for um, multiple channels of trade partners. So uh, the, the, the easiest wins here are for um, members of this, of, these, of this organization that, has, that have energy to export with those who need it, uh, and similarly those who have um, uh, agricultural goods that, that they can export to do that without protectionist barriers uh, among the other countries, so as to allow for uh, easier uh, mm -hmm. transport and trade. But how is the Ukraine crisis and the uh, this looming uh, food crisis affecting these member countries? Because we know that they are heavily reliant on imports. Not only that, but we're talking about um, it, these are developing countries, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the population, we're talking about over a billion people among them. So there, there are a billion mouths to feed, if not more. Uh, they, at a time when energy is very, very expensive, when, when you know, oil prices are, are through the roof, and a large component of agricultural products prices, mm -hmm. uh, the cost of, of getting food to your table is energy, is uh, transportation. So it's going to be very difficult, the challenges that they have to address uh, to provide uh, security, uh, you know, uh, agricultural security. Yes. Uh, so we'll see what happens, but it's going to be a, a difficult time. So, Osama, how do you think it's going to uh, play out? And is there a unified stance towards Russia's attack on Ukraine or members pursue their own national interests? So that's very interesting, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of moving pieces to that question. First of all, one of the best things about this organization is that many of the countries face a similar set of problems, right? So yes. although we have not seen um, sort of a unanimous stance uh, on the Russian invasion, mm -hmm. but many of the problems that the common man in these very countries face, they are similar, like exposure to food prices. Pakistan, for instance, is the second high, is, 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 is most vulnerable to rising food prices. Nigeria as well. Egypt uh, imports almost more than 85% of its wheat from these countries. So while there is not a unanimous stance on it, but I think uh, the need for uh, a cooperative effort in, 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 in practice, maybe, you know, to utilize the youth bulge of Iran, to utilize the youth bulge of Pakistan, to utilize the 400 million workforce divided amongst these countries, that's, that's extraordinary. But uh, as we are discussing, and Taha very rightly mentioned, the, I think the diplomatic and geopolitical issues yeah. Uh, spilling over to the economic ones like inflation, they will sort of hamper uh, the very potential of the organization, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So do you agree, Taha? I mean, could this uh, organization provide an alternative platform for these countries? Because we know that some of them do disagree on some certain matters. Uh, the, the unfortunate truth is absolutely. I mean, not only do countries have to think about um, the, uh, what's, what's beneficial to them and the other members of this organization, but they all have their own agendas. Let's, let's be honest here. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about Pakistan, for example, and Bangladesh. They're in a neighborhood where uh, Pakistan is very closely aligned with China, for example. Um, what can it do? I mean, it, it, and China is also not, is very uh, friendly to Russia recently. So can Pakistan come out strongly and, and talk about how the Ukraine crisis uh, invasion is a problem? Probably not. Let's just be honest with, it, with, each, with each other about that. So um, all these countries will, will, will potentially think about what's best for, their, for the organization as a whole, but simultaneously they have to decide what's best for their own agendas, what's best for their own countries. And then in that case, they have to think locally. So it's going to be a, a, an uphill battle. For example, could this uh, platform contribute uh, to Turkey and Egypt's efforts to man ties? I think it's it's a it's a it's a great avenue for that. Why not? I mean, it's uh, all developing countries uh, need to keep their eye on what the goal is, and the goal is to help their their populations. Really, yes. um, you know, I, I, being ideologues uh, is a, is is a luxury that developing countries unfortunately don't have. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think uh, one of the one of the goals of this organization is to promote democracy. That's great. I think that's that's something that they should be doing. Um, and while they have had problems, like you were talking about, Turkey and Egypt, for example, have had problems in the past, it appears that, that uh, not forgetting those problems or not putting them behind us is a luxury that neither country has. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Turkey is mending ties with a lot of countries. All countries are, after the pandemic, have kind yeah. of 
uh, come together because they, they have to. Everyone needs everyone. We live in a global environment. And so, uh, especially after pandemic, they kind of uh, put aside their political differences right. and focus on economy, energy, and cooperation. So, some of what specific sectors we're talking about here are countries aiming to invest one another, which comes to the fore. So if you look at uh, their uh, recently released decennial uh, plan, decennial strategy, it involves all sorts of sector, industry, tourism, energy, uh, and other sectors as well. But uh, our prime minister, Pakistan's ex-prime minister, Imran Khan, he actually uh, proposed a five-point uh, you know, strategy, uh, which included uh, sharing technology, uh, mm -hmm. mobilizing financial and other resources for common goods problems, such as one of the, one of the biggest ones, climate change, uh, and I al already mentioned migrant workforce. Remittances amongst these countries can be a huge uh, asset. Uh, secondly, once again, uh, we can also focus on knowledge-based economy. But all of this, let me add just very quickly, all of this will only happen when the D8 block moves up the economic integration. So right now, they are a PTA, which is a preferential trade agreement, right? But they need to go beyond that. But how, so how to, to create this economic integration? What steps so, should be taken? So first, I mean, one leads to the other. It's a circular argument. So if they institutionalize this, which will involve them reducing tariff rates, which would involve them easier access of uh, people moving one uh, to and fro from one country to another, which will allow them more financial liberalization amongst these eight countries, which will allow easy transfer of technology and knowledge. So these are the steps that will institutionalize the, the D8 block into something that would really make a difference. Okay. So, right now, mm -hmm. I don't think so. So yeah. uh, we see there isn't a uh, collective will to enhance cooperation. So what should be done? And what kind of a role uh, Turkey is playing, especially in terms of this economic integration as well as its uh, defense industry? Uh, I think Turkey's defense industry and its recent success uh, highlighted in Ukraine and elsewhere uh, is important for these other countries to, re to, um, to take advantage of, really, to, to provide security. I mean, the, the ultimate goal for all countries is, is to be safe. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that pe perhaps potentially Turkish, uh, Turkish uh, industrial, military industrial companies can help with. Um, but at the same time, uh, like Osama was, was highlighting, uh, economic cooperation is really the key to, to a success of any, uh, any block of countries. And so if that happens, unless that happens, this, this, this organization really won't move, move much forward. So that's mm -hmm. what we need to look forward to. All right. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Osama, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, from Pakistan. And Taha, thanks for being me here on set. Appreciate it a lot.